we are at time. Should I begin? Yeah, okay. Um, so hello everybody and good morning from Northeast Ohio and the United States. Uh, my name is Matt Crawford. I'm an associate professor in the Department of History at uh, Kent State University. Um, welcome to our panel, Traditional and Early Modern Drug Knowledge. We've got some very interesting presentations coming up and I'm looking forward to the discussion uh, that will follow. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to thank um, the organizers of this festival for the invitation to chair this panel and also for organizing this great event. And um, uh, yeah, I think this might be the first professional conference I've attended uh, since we went on lockdown. So uh, very exciting. Um, I'm sure people have, have been to other panels and heard about the uh, procedure, but just uh, a quick note, um, I'll briefly introduce all three of our speakers in the order that they will be presenting. Each presenter will then have uh, 15 minutes to present, um, <clears throat> and I will um, probably come on camera maybe when there's a minute left to let you know when you're getting close to time. We'll save all questions and discussions until after all three presenters have given their presentations. Um, and you can post your questions in the chat and I uh, will serve as kind of moderator posing questions to the panelists. Um, just a reminder, keep your microphones muted and your cameras off uh, while others are speaking. Okay. So our first speaker is Eduardo Pierni, who is working on his PhD in history of medicine at the University of Geneva. His research focuses on the role of opiates in European medicine in the 17th century. The title of his presentation is Different Peoples, Different Addictions, The Recognition of Different Cultures of Intoxication in Early Modern Medicine. <clears throat> After Eduardo, we will have Pedro Carlesi, who is a pharmacist doing his uh, doing interdisciplinary research that draws on anthropology as well as the health sciences in his work towards a PhD in collective health at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. His most recent publication is titled How to Carry Out a Democratic Ethnobotanical Study, which I think sounds very interesting, published in Ethnobiology Letters in 2019. The title of his talk is Neo-Traditional Medi Medications, Ethnographic Contributions to the Conceptual Definition. And then our final speaker for this morning is, uh, or maybe afternoon, depending on where you are, <laughs> is uh, Julia Nurse, who is a research development specialist at the Wellcome Collection and has a forthcoming publication with the British Academy Proceedings Series from Oxford University Press. The title of Julia's talk will be the healing power of color pigments as potions in the early modern period. Um, so that's that's it for me until we get to the questions and I'll turn it over to Eduardo. Hi everyone, um, I'll just share my screen. Um, thank you for the introduction. Just to clarify the slides, I put some quotes that I'll let you read by yourself uh, so I hope all you could see them and uh, just make my comments so we don't lose impression that precious time really. So let's dive in. I want to start my presentation with this quote by the 16th century French botanist Pierre Bellon, that in describing all sorts of curiosities and wanderings he witnesses during his journey to the Middle East, just dedicated a chapter of this work uh, to the peculiar Turkish habit of opium consumption. Bellon knew perfectly that opium poppy was well known in Europe, where physicians prescribed its derivates for a wide range of disease, but he had to make it interesting by showing it as uh, the main subject of what we now identify as a different culture of intoxication. And this quote uh, about the use of injuries related to opium instead of alcohol is very effective in this sense. Uh, Bellan in his work then on describing this different aspect of the central rule of opium had in Turkey, where it was clearly considered the main intoxicant, whereas in Europe it never really challenged the prominent place of alcoholic traits. This quote indeed is constantly showing the analogies between the effect 
the social role of Fokin and alcohol in the Turkish and European societies. Following this pattern, the medical reports uh, on the new plants discovered in the Eastern and Western Indies, as well as the travel literature, played a huge role in this sense, providing both a medical and cultural explanation for the consumption of foreign drugs. The next example is the one of uh, Gersela Orta, who, eight years later, the release of her work, published the Yearly Treatise on the Medical Plants of India. The treatise is written in a dialogical form between Rana, an imaginary physician who is visiting India and wishes to know more about its drug and art itself. It's interesting to note that in the chapter dedicated to the description of cannabis, limit bandwidth, uh, how the Orta claimed that the main purpose of the Indian's cannabis consumption was to get drunk and get out of their mind, and how our peoples made different electories mixing cannabis with other drugs, always for the same purpose, for focusing in particular on the moors, who, because of their addiction of, to opium, used to mix it with cannabis in order to put the man to be out of mind and raise it above all care and anxieties. In this way, Daur made it clear how every people had its favorite drug that was used for the same purpose, getting drunk and going out of mind. The fact that the altered state of mind generated by the drug is always associated with drunkness shows how alcohol, cannabis, and opium intoxication were considered on the same level. Of great significance is also the sub subsequent statement of Taorta, who made a central point in the definition of what we now call drug addiction. Answering to Ruano, who asked him if this lecture is made of cannabis had a pleasant effect on everybody, he claimed that everyone would appreciate it only if a customer, so that they established a connection between the pleasant effects and the frequent use of drugs. Lastly, in the description of the cannabis intoxication of a Portuguese jester in him personally, he reported that those who saw him in this condition thought he had an ordinary drinking bout, comparing once again the common European method of intoxication with the foreign one. The work of Garcia da Horta probably exerted a strong influence on the Spanish physician Nicolas Monarques, who published in a few years later an important treatise where he described the medical plants recently discovered in a new world. In the chapter dedicated to the description of tobacco, he reported first an experience of religious, religious psychotropy practiced by the Indian priests, but then he went on claiming that also the rest of the population can it itself without any religious goals, but just to have pleasure. The description of this sort of psychotropic experience wasn't so original as, as Monardas himself recognized how it was a common thing to find plants with this effect in the medical literature, showing how this, mind altering, this new mind-altering drug fit logically in a well-known tradition of intoxication, even if at the time it was not deemed and lacked a specific vocabulary. Monardas indeed quoted the very recent work of Garcia da Horta on India's cannabis consumption, outlining the analogy between these two practices. Monardas, in fact, wanted to show how the search for mind-altering experience was part of uh, every culture, and that the choice of a certain intoxicant depended on the environmental background rather than by some sort of racial and moral differences. And the case of the African slaves, uh, I put here uh, the, the quotes, habits in the new world was very evident in this sense. Um, the last work of uh, medical travel literature I want to take into account is Prospera Alpinis de Medicina Egyptorum. This Italian physician lived some years in Egypt and reported about drugs and medical practices he found in that country. In his imaginary conversation with his former teacher, Guglielmino, he gives very interesting insights about the Egyptian use of opium and cannabis, as well as the reason they are behind the, their spread. In the chapter dedicated to the altering medicaments, he gave a geographical explanation on the development of different cultures of intoxication in different peoples. According to the Galenic theory of humoral balance, People who live in warm places, such as the, Egypt the Egyptians, would prefer to use cold drugs like opium, while vice versa, people who live in cold places, like the Germans and the Poles, would indulge in warm substances like wine. In this way, from a medical standpoint, it could justify the emergence of addiction, as it was because of this inclination that the bad habits and the abuses in the way of living originated. Then in this quote, and the other quote, answering Gilandino's claim that this amount of poison and drug could kill anyone, he referred to the Galenic notion of tolerance to explain that those who would ingest a small amount of poison every day would develop an immunity to it. 
In this passage, you remarked how uh, in doing this, they will develop a dangerous addiction, which will enslave them to take opium every day. In reading these statements, it becomes clear how deeply Alpini understood both the danger related to drug addiction, uh, very often neglected by those who were directly involved, uh, and the phenomenon on, of uh, withdrawal. He considered the addiction as a consequence of its systematic use, as the inveterate habit somehow tamed the poisonous power of the drug, even if some bad effects still remained unnoticed by the consumers. This consideration looks very similar to the wine addiction attributed to the northern peoples, whose generous dosage and incapacity to recognize the bad effects could be given by the long time taming of the drug. Another aspect, which is also very interesting, is the treatment, treatment of withdrawal with the suggestion to drink altered wine to compensate for the lack of the main intoxicant, showing how, even in this case, alcohol and opium could be uniquely replaceable. Well, to evaluate the impact of these works on the awareness of the existence of different cultures of intoxication, I will take Britain as a privileged observatory due to the spread of intoxicant consumption throughout the 17th century. If in 16th century Britain, the local culture of intoxication consisting mainly of health drinking, only a few decades later, the situation changed completely. Alongside the physiolog physiological growth of alcohol consumption due to the demographic, demographic increase, a foreign drug, tobacco, became part of the British regime. Phil Whittington has recently shown how this quick growth in the market for beer, wine, and tobacco coupled with the development of a social identity based on the consumption of intoxicants. Even if the authorities and a good part of the medical community first condemned tobacco fiercely, its assimilation in the British culture of intoxication shows the importance of the social and counter cultural aspect involved in the process. The anonymous satirical, satirical dialogue when beer and tobacco contending for superiority shows how socially stratified was the drinking culture in nearly modern Britain, as each drug was associated to a social status. The aristocratic wine was a gentleman, National popular beer was a citizen, rural ale a countryman, and tobacco a swaggering gentleman. This humorous competition reflected the current hierarchy at the time among the intoxicants. The dominance of alcoholic drinks had not really been challenged by other drugs, with the exception of tobacco, which indeed appears later in the dialogue. In this way, the cultural and social connotation of intoxicants represented metaphorically the social status of their consumers. The, the editorial success and the good amount of reprints of the works of Monardes, Daorte and Pini, as well as the attention given to the subject by British physicians, provided an increasing attention to this cultural aspect of intoxication. The quick assimilation of tobacco in the European regime, however, clashed with the case of other drugs that, even if they look similar in the fact, did not follow the same path. The case of opium is particularly interesting in this sense, as opium poppy grows endemically in Europe, and had been part of the Western pharmacopoeia since ancient times. But its integration in the culture of intoxication was far, far longer and more tortuous. Even if the recognition of opium as the main intoxicant for Turks and Egyptians reflected the same pattern of tobacco use among the American Indians, it never really reached the cultural status and integration in the British culture of intoxication according to tobacco. However, some physician and learned men at the beginning of the 17th century were quite optimistic about the quick assimilation of opium in the Western regime. One of the authors who represented this new attitude was the iatrochemical physician Angelo Sala, who published in 1614 the Opiologia, a treatise entirely dedicated to opium, where he paid great attention to this aspect. Commenting the alleged inoculity of opium among the Turks, we follow with Alpini in considering it a consequence of of their daily use of it. The Turks were accustomed to opium like the Indians were with tobacco. And considering that the Europeans started to use this new drug daily, they could do the same with opium. In probability, even if his assumption that lots of people would become accustomed to opium was rather accurate, the path for opium to enter in the pantheon of British drugs was not so easy, as the example of two famous physicians operating in the mid 17th century testified. The first is Nicholas Culpepper the author of the famous article, that in rejecting the daily use of opium among his countrymen, underlined the importance of the origin of every medicament. He claimed, indeed, that people should use only drugs which are grown in their home. This kind of pharmacocinophobic attitude had emerged already in the 16th century, when some physicians argued that the American remedies were dangerous because God, 
created medical plants only for people who live in that specific land. The status of autumn, in this sense, however, is quite ambiguous, as the same author reported in Serbal how opium poppy grows wildly in Ireland and in the gardens in England. But still, uh, from the early 17th century onwards, opium imports remained an important part of the large-scale commerce with the East. And, and that was the reason why people often, often considered it as a foreign drug. This kind of argument, however, was used in a very flexible and, I would say, utilitaristic way, and the successful integration of tobacco provided a powerful proof to this computation. Also, Thomas Willis, physician and founding member of the Royal Society, elaborated his own mechanical theory about the effect of opium. In this way, he gave an explanation about why the opium particles are less poisonous in people who take it several times, developing, he would say, a kind of armor to it. He did not limit this peculiarity to the Eastern people, because he recognized the same evidence in some of his countrymen, showing how in the second half of the 17th century, opium taking spread even among the British. In the final reference, indeed, he mentioned the smoking of tobacco as a cornerstone to show a successful case of taming and integration of a drug. Conversely, the spread and use of opium, attested also by the increase in imports from the East, seemed not to be associated with a cultural integration in society. In the learned and popular culture, its use was always considered only medical, without any recognition of some sort of recreational value, which by contrast was fully recognized among the Orientals. Alcoholic drinks and tobacco were also part of the Western pharmacopoeia, but in the middle of the 17th century, people used it more for their recreational value. The difference with opium consisted in the way of taking it, as the lack of recognition of addiction and recreational value could be addressed to the so-called set and setting. The set and setting is the background and the way of administration of a certain drug, which is central in the consequent development of an addiction. Nowadays, several studies evidence how even the administration of strong substances like morphine usually does not end up in an addiction if it occurs in a medical context. That is due to the unpleasant feelings associated by the consumer to its administration, which it does not want to repeat. On the contrary, people who take drugs in a convivial situation have much more probability for repeating it and to develop an addiction. Uh, the last example I want to provide uh, is uh, the one of uh, John Jones. In fact, the turning point in the compression of this aspect came. Eduardo? At... Yeah, just one minute. Yeah, yeah, one, one. Yep. You're, we're at 15 uh, minutes. Yeah, he argued that okay. all the effects of the drug could be explained by the fact that it causes a pleasant sensation, with late variety, relaxation of all sensible parts of the body. So, uh, just make quickly, uh, Jones told it was also, opium was also a means to conform and liberate the sense of the soul, so that it's psychotropy associated to drugs use in a specific psychological role. Um, he did not give any clues for a social way of taking opium. Rather, its continuous analogy with wine, which is still considered inferior, suggests that he was fully aware of the current role of intoxicant in the early modern British society. In conclusion, we can claim how the awareness of the existence of other cultures of intoxication, evident in the analogy between the effect of alcohol and other drugs in nearly modern medical treatises, boosted the discussion in it, with reflection not only on the medical lore, but also on the social values surrounding it. In early modern Europe, the discovery of the new world provided the emergence of a new identity, shaped not only by religion, but also by the political, cultural, and medical aspects. In Britain, this new culture associated with the use of intoxicant was strongly influenced by the recognition of a different ways of taking drugs, which would become a perfect benchmark to reflect the local habit of alcohol consumption. The importance of the cultural context, and especially of the so-called set and setting of drug taking, is though central to understand the emergence of certain cultural intoxication, as the quick assimilation of tobacco shows. Alcohol consumption seems to be deeply rooted in Britain, and the Western countries so that it could be considered as one of its trademarks. Even if opium was widely used, it had never been really questioned the prominence of wine, beer, and the new entry tobacco as the most used regulation of drugs in every modern view. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you. I think we're moving on to uh, Pedro, and we'll have the questions at the end. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, Matt. 
Uh, I want to say thank you also to Lucas, Christine, and Greg for the organization of this interesting festival. So um, it's a pleasure to be here. And as Matt said, I'm a pharmacist. And since my master, I've been taking connections between the health and the social science, especially from the anthropology research, which I keep closest to. Currently, I'm conducting a field work research at pharmacies, herbariums, and laboratories, focusing on the production of legitimacy of herbal medicines that are offered on the Brazilian public health system. Um, the, the text I bring to this conference is elaborated from an ethnographic study I've been conducing in Brazil about how certain practices, knowledge, and healing materialities produce legitimacy before the state in order to be legitimized as medications. At this moment, I'm highly interested in medical herbs and phytotherapeutic drugs, which I've named neo-traditional medications. I've been using this term as a comprehensive analytical category to encompass the phenomena of make these therapies institutional, which are affirmed in the public debate due to the skill of combining both the hegemonic biomedical science speech and the culturally located traditional speech. By using this term, I intend to avoid essentialisms of what could be called both scientific as well as traditional, and especially I beat in this collision as an analytical case. The term now traditional was initially coined in medical anthropology in French investigative projects conducted in African countries since the 90s. However, in Brazil, the term acquired new shapes and has been helping me highlight particularities of the Brazilian ethnographic context. Since the end of 1970, the World Health Organization has been encouraging the development of public policies that expand the therapeutic possibilities offered by their member states. In reference to this expansion, two categories were gradually built in the agency's scope, traditional medicine and complementary and alternative medicine. In Brazil, this approach is especially related to the promotion of popular and traditional knowledge of healing plants to become acceptable if validated or manufactured by technoscientific practices. Beyond the domain of science over the other ways to produce knowledge, I argue in favor of neo-traditional medications category in order to present new arrangements and social dynamics that define Brazil's medication policies nowadays. To the colleagues who are not familiar with the Brazilian social history, uh, it's interesting to underline that the Brazilian public health system in its current form exists since the 80s, and access to medication has been free of charge and unlimited since its creation. However, products developed from the national biodiversity, only given a direct principle in 2006, strongly supported by what is called as complementary and integrative health practice. What one can see from this nationalization movement is that the conversion of medicines into practice and the traditional into complementary and integrative did not happen only on a terminology sphere, but also on an identity and political one, um, which doesn't put away the contradictions of modernity as a social project capable of installing a self-emancipatory regime from itself. Ever since, part of the medication chain of production has been changing, as well as how we legitimize these therapies. Looking to the historical path of institutionalization of phytotherapy in Brazil, we are able to see that knowledge that was once marginalized is brought back nowadays, transformed and institutionalized as a way to fortify the Brazilian democracy. Ever though there is no protection policy or respectful safeguard towards the traditional people, 
In this article, which I invite you to read after the festival, uh, I will present the pharmaceutical arrangement that's predominant today here, called Pharmacia Viva or Living Pharmacy. I have some photos to share with you. Hold on. Yeah, perfect. Okay, the term is glowing, living pharmacy, and it suggests an alleviament potential of the pharmaceutical practice appreciated to the modern times. Recently, Ailton Krenak, who is an important indigenous leader in Brazil, stated that the modern world searches for the traditional people because it needs to renovate its blood. It's like a hemodialysis of the heritage we modern day people have inherited that since the age of enlightenment. From these pharmacies, the produced medications have claimed space in the public sphere for carrying the way of correcting the bad development with them. They are small public labs usually implemented in places where the health product supply chain is deficient, and they are equipped to carry out from the herbs planting to the manufacturing of medications for common disease amongst the locals. The model, which became national during the Lula president administration, is innovative because it's elaborated from the idea of local productive arrangements, partnering up with family agriculture, landless workers movement, quilombos, indigenous communities, and others who are systematically neglected by the state. Living pharmacies uh, in some states like Maranhão, which take part in this ethnography, uh, has been fundamental to improve the Human Development Index. If no traditional category alludes to hybrid cultures, it's fundamental to highlight that the powers between traditions and modernity are not symmetric, but oblique. If the pharmacies are inserted in a context of inner culturalities mediated by the plant's materialities, which transit in a network of technical and no technical actors, or even among scientific, popular, traditional doings, with the advent of the laboratories and without a reconstruction policy for the ways of producing techno scientific knowledge, this inner culturality stopped being counter hegemonic or even reconstructive, being inserted in a field of interpretative and symbolic dispute in which techno-scientific rationality reigns. I say this because, to become a national law project, living pharmacies have gone through a series of normative reforms that do little considering the each territory's characteristics. They became hermetic workplaces with restricted and sterilized access, assigned to separate the plants from the outside world, giving them new meanings from the powerful speech of pharmacology. Even though these productive places are adapted to the national context and were created based on public consultations, they are not so different from the ones directed at conventional compounding pharmacies a condition which guides a previously culturally located work with strong participation from the people to a pasteurization of meanings attributed to the healing and illness, and such pasteurization is mediated by the technique. The, observa the observations shared here suggest that if you want to understand the persuasive duality of neo-traditional category, we need to go back to the modern scientific goals in its technical, practical, and political compromises, in which technology and domination seems to be fused in the same social project. Based on that, I raised a few questions from this ethnographic context 
to sum up my ideas at this moment. What are the possibilities of what is called today traditional, alternative, integrative, complementary medicine, and so many others, in the reconstruction of the health practice without revisiting the alliances and cosmopolitical commitments of the terms? Does the success of no scientific practice of health depend on its own subaltern conviction? In Latin America, is it possible to break the colonial advance without abandoning the Western intellectual heritage and its cosmopolitical commitments like, for example, the term medication itself? Or, in other words, is it possible to decolonize medication? That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pedro. That was great. Um, so we'll move on to Julia at this point. Julia, you're unmuted. Okay, thank you. I have my first slide, please. Hi, um, so I'm a researcher at Welcome Collection London. I'm going to talk to you about something uh, slightly different now. Um, I'm going to consider the healing power of colours during the early modern period. And I do this through an analysis of the dual use of plant-based and mineral products, which were used for their medicinal and pigment properties. Uh, this study stems from an original conservation study on the types of pigments used in Wilkin Collection's manuscript a, a few years ago. If we could have the next slide, please. So why is colour significant? The chemical reaction underpins how and what colours we see due to the varying velocities and their sens sensations on the eye. Uh, it wasn't until Isaac Newton's optic breakthroughs in the 1660s, and we see a, an illustration from his um, optics um, uh, publication from 1704 here on the left, that this scientific rationale was understood. Before then, understanding of colour was based on Aristotle's ancient theory that it was God sent from heaven through celestial rays of light. He suggested that all colours came from white and black and related them to the four elements, water, air, earth and fire. And adherence to these ancient theories throughout the medieval and early modern period affected how colour was used by herbalists, apothecaries and physicians. And the colour of the plant is dictated by a compound known as flavonoids from the Latin flavus, which means yellow. Uh, rich in what we now know to be antioxidant properties, flavonoids help combat free radicals and oxidative stress that can induce imbalance and consequently wreak havoc on the body, both internally and externally. And thocyanins, of course, are a subgroup of flavonoids that also originate in the ancient Greek for flower, kyanios, meaning dark blue and all its variant pigments. Fruits thought to be rich in this group include blackberries, of course, as you see here on the right, uh, that have long been recognised for their nutritional properties. Next slide, please. The perpetuation of ancient theories about colour uh, originated in Latin and later vernacular translations of ancient texts that circulated Europe thanks to the printing revolution of the early modern period. The essential virtues of colour in nature had been recognised for centuries, but it wasn't until modern times that the important compounds within plant colour um, are understood to have, been, have significant antioxidant properties. During the Renaissance period, an ad fontes, which meant um, the sources in Latin, method of sourcing was used. This publication on the left on surgery from the late 16th century heralds the ancient Greek physician Hippocrates as divine, for instance. Readers were encouraged to use and evaluate ancient materials and ideas from the Greek and Roman empires. The printing industry helped disseminate these theories through the production of multiple copies. In the ancient Greek Hippocratic corpus, disease was thought to be caused by a term called isonomia, the prevalence of one of the four bodily humours and their associated season, otherwise known as humoral theory. It was believed that universal elements were linked to bodily parts and ultimately temperaments that were essentially given a colour. Autumn was dry and connected with the earth, the spleen and black bile, which could induce a melancholic or black temperament. Spring was wet and correlated with the air, the heart and a sanguine or red temperament. Summer was hot and connected with the fire, liver and yellow bile inducing ambition, 
and restlessness and a tendency to anger, otherwise known as choleric. Hume, uh, winter was cold and affiliated with water, the brain, and a phlegmatic or essentially white temperament that they rendered a calm and thoughtful character. Imbalance in any of these humoral types, known as dyscrasia, was rectified by prudent Hippocratic physicians, largely by a regimen of diet, activity, and exercise, but it could also be treated by concoctions of herbs that functioned by contraries of colours and elements. The Aristotelian golden mean, red and white, was considered the perfect equilibrium. So these theories and their coloured associations dominated traditional Western medicine until the 18th century. Next slide, please. So as described just now, humoral theory was essentially coloured and continued to influence medical thinking throughout the period. We can see how it was used in a comprehensive overview of medicine written by an English physician known as Gilbert in the 12th century. Wellcome Collection have a 15th century copy of this work, proof that these views continue to stand. According to Gilbert, colour was key to identifying if the body was off balance. If the affected part of the body was red, it was sanguineous. If green or yellow, it was bilious or choleric. If white, it was phlegmatic. If black or blue, it was full of bile due to abscesses or strangulation of the blood. Sometimes opposites were used to redress this balance. In this recipe for sore eyes, it seems to suggest mixing verdigris, which was green and toxic, in wine and inserting directly into the eyes, though there are also instructions for plasters to be placed on top of the eyes. So perhaps it was intended to be administered in the form of a plaster to draw out the redness. Next slide, please. Choleric humour was characterised by a bilious imbalance of humours that rendered the patient green or yellow. The disease commonly associated with this humour was jaundice, a word that originates from the old French jaunis for yellow and Latin galbinus. Jaundice, a noun, sometimes termed yellow evil, is also a word that entwines meanings from medicine, colour and temperament. The cause of the yellowing effects on the body, particularly the white of the eyes and skin pigment, is now known to be due to an excess of bilirubin, a chemical produced by the liver. But in early modern medicine, this yellowing effect was believed to be caused by an imbalance of the liver or an irregularity in bile, as Stephen Bateman suggested in 1582. In this text here where he suggests um, saffron, being used to rebalance uh, the jaundiced body. By the 18th century, the complaint had earned the title putrid bilious fever, um, and the yellowing of the skin caused by yellow fever is demonstrated in this series of 19th century images uh, depicting the development of the disease um, in well complexion. Next slide, please. Related to humoral theory was uroscopy, or the study of urine. Theories about urine appeared, appeared in editions of the Articella, a collection of medical treaties used as a reference manual throughout the Middle Ages. Diagnosis of conditions was based on a visual test alone, a practice that continued into the early modern period. Practitioners could diagnose a condition based on what they saw in a urine sample using schematic diagrams, wheels or grids that described the appearance and humoral significance of colours. This colour chart show, showing the 20 colours um, by Ulrich Pinder comes from a 16th century manuscript by um, Johann de Ketham. Each coloured flask is coloured a different shade of urine depending on the imbalance of humour. Opposite, on the left, uh, the same flasks are arranged in rows with more detail about the colours and what each shade might mean. The colour was just a rough guide, of course, it was usually added later by artisans and didn't always conform to the printer's specifications, which is why the text was so crucial. Next slide, please. So it was believed that plants were um, also given a signature or a mark and their shape, colour, texture, habitat and taste were a clue to the plant's healing properties. This theory again was, was ancient. The likes of Pliny the Elder and Dioscorides and other early classical scholars all alluded to it and it continued to be developed in the early modern period, particularly by the alchemist Paracelsus. The examples illustrated here demonstrate the healing power of colour. Burning colours were useful for inflammations and yellow plants for yellowing conditions like jaundice or naughty livers. This theory was useful and provided a symmetry with nature, visual clues to aid observation. It provided a way of remembering and transmitting plant knowledge. But this theory wasn't without its critics, of course. From the mid 16th century, Rembert Dodens and English naturalist John Ray started to question its validity, calling it absurd and fanciful. In fact, the symmetry didn't always work. Of course, for example, blood root with its scarlet red roots was thought to sort out blood problems. Though in reality, it just made you sick, a sign of ridding the body of toxins, apparently. Next slide, please. 
Colour was also used to maintain physical beauty to rectify and discolouring complaints like Raven's the skin, rosacea. The overlap with colours used to treat the skin, as well as by painters, became entwined during the 16th century by Italian writers. Eight physical colours of physical beauty were defined by Agnola Ferenzola's Discourse on the Beauty of Women, 1541, shown on the left here. He said uh, they had blonde and tawny for hair, black for the eyes, red, white, vermilion, and flesh pink for the lips and skin. Many of the pigments used to recreate these colours were also used in wall painting and drew on Aristotle's origina, original colour humoral based theories in his text De Coloribus. Influenced by Firenzola's colour theory, English physician Richard Haydock also linked painting and face painting in his 1598 publication, a tract containing the arts of curious painting, and the title page you see here. Next slide, please. Colour played a, a large part also in an apothecary's daily manipulation of substances, along with smell and touch. The physician services were expensive and affordable only by the very wealthy at this time, so the apothecary filled the gap, offering cheaper alternatives, as well as other products like pigments and domestic necessities. Filippo Pastorino was a well-established apothecary in 16th century Bologna. He claimed apothecaries were first and foremost artisans with a strong religious vocation. They were experts in materia medica. He claimed a good apothecary knows about substances by their taste, smell and colour. The overlap between drugs, spices and colour substances was therefore inevitable. Pigmentums, which meant paint in Latin, were purchased from the apothecary and were produced using the very same techniques as drugs. So this crossover isn't surprising. The similar term pigmenta was used to describe spices, condiments, drugs and the substance of colours. Many pigments, um, of course, had a dual purpose, but some were more dangerous than others and they came from animal, plant, and mineral sources. It was usually the latter that were generally more toxic, like verdigris, for, exam for example. An evidence of this overlap is seen in publications like the chemist Robert Dossie's The Elaboratory Laid Open from 1758, and his Handmaid of the Arts, which he presented um, a practical artisanal knowledge, listing the uses of the same base materials used in the preparation of medicines and the production of various artistic and decorative objects. He deliberately used the term materia pictori, a subtle attempt to elevate the status of the visual and decorative arts by drawing parallels with the term materia medica. Dossi's elaboratory also outlined methods of chemistry required in the making of drugs and medicines, and these same methods were required for the pigments also. Next slide, please. The method Welcome Collection's conservation team used to identify pigments in our medieval manuscripts is known as fibre optics reflectance spectroscopy. This method has been used for at least two decades to identify pigments and dye stuffs. It, it uses a source of light, a spectrometer, and two fibre optics, one to deliver the light on the object and the other to collect the light reflected. Here you can see a conservator using the spectrometer to analyse manuscript 8932, an extremely rare and tiny medieval folding almanac in the collection. The colours identified in this manuscript include red lead and red ochre in the orange, Folium uh, for the purple, Brazil wood, cockid dye from the insect in the purples used, uh, cinnabar for red, azurite for blue, indigo and carbon for grey, gold, and red, red ochre for brown. Next slide, please. The red pigment, cinnabar or vermilion, was the most detected pigment. This naturally occurring, occurring form of mineral was commonly used in manuscript illumination, but it contains the highly toxic mercury sulphide. In this illustration on the left from a late 15th century alchemical manuscript in the collection, it's visible in the cushion on which the infant Christ lies. Ironically, this manuscript included receipts for dyes and tinctures. Linked to cinnabar and often confused with it since Roman times was the coloured non-toxic resin known as dragon's blood seen in this late 17th century apothecary jar from the Science Museum in London. This resin was obtained from a number of plant genera and has been used in continuous use since ancient times as a varnish, medicine, incense, and a dye. Uh, next slide, please. One pigment that wasn't detected in the conservation study, but was clearly used as a dye and remedy, was the buckthorn species of tree, particularly Ramnus cathartica, or purging buckthorn. Perhaps the most apt use of this pigment as an associated remedy may be seen in the image of a squatting, defecating man in the Welcome Collection manuscript 990 a 17th century illustrated manuscript containing various medicinal receipts by Franciscan order from southern Germany. The laxative effects of the acrid, nauseous, bitter juice extracted from the sap green ripe berries were obviously effective. 
the sugared aromatic syrup of buckthorn, known as Succus Ramni, was a preparation recorded in many domestic receipt books, notably the uh, one from the Johnson family. Also known as still the grain yellow, this pigment was also used by artists and printmakers like Christophe Leblanc and was derived from the buckthorn species Ramus saxitalis or Avignon berries. The colour was used in his four colour method of printing, Mexton seen uh, top right here. And next, please. So to conclude, the medicinal and artisanal use of colour pigments was steeped in ancient traditions that continue to infiltrate pharmaceutical practice throughout the medieval and early modern periods. Humoral theory and the doctrine of signatures played a significant role in how and when certain pigmented products were used through colours, though, sorry, though colours were subject to variation and sometimes confusion. Colour changes based on these theories helped medical practitioners work out when and when, when and if the body was off balance and treatment often use coloured remedies, sometimes opposite, sometimes similar, to help remediate or rebalance the dyscrasic body. Linked to this colour guide was the analysis of the colour of urine, which provided sufficient evidence in itself of a patient's health for much of the early modern period. While coloured diseases like jaundice were treated with related pigmented products thought to also rebalance the body. The search for uh, beauty brought dangers linked to the toxic lightning effects of the white lead commonly applied to both the face and paintings, but which continued to be used. Evidence of the dual use of pigments by both medics and artisans could be traced back to this original general store. The earlier apothecary shops of the medieval period uh, where a range of products were available for sale. Interest in the nature of pigments is crucial today, of course, by our conservators to ensure, ensure the preservation of color in manuscripts. In studying the various pigments used uh, reveals much about how material medical is applied and understood through uh, manuscripts and recipe books and contemporary literature, literature aimed at the early modern physician and apothecary. The Welcome Collection provides a rich resource for this study. And I leave you here with uh, possibly my favourite manuscript in the collection, uh, Manuscript 990, this compendium of popular medicine and surgery. Um, if you're interested to know what pigments uh, were used in the images for this manuscript, uh, please do get in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia, for a great presentation. Um, so we are more or less on time. We have plenty of time for questions and discussion. Um, so if people have questions, please feel free to paste them in the chat and I will share them with our presenters. And I think probably if our presenters want to just be on mic and on camera for, for this portion, I think we can, we can survive that <laughs> technologically. Um, so if anybody has any questions, please go ahead. I, there were a couple of questions, um, for Pedro already, and so maybe we can start with those and as people are thinking or typing out their questions. Um, <clears throat> so, Pedro, you've gotten two questions here about the idea of the um, Farmacia Viva, the living pharmacy. Um, Erica is asking about ecotourism in uh, Brazil and um, if that's part of kind of the landscape of living pharmacies or is another form of colonizing indigenous knowledge, uh, indigenous practices and indigenous plants. And then um, we had another question. I don't see it right now, but I have it written down about just asking you to elaborate on the living pharmacy and what sort of activities okay, are involved in that. So um, uh, thank you all. I really, really wish that my Brazilian English could answer <laughs> all your questions. <laughs> so uh, it, it's very new in Brazil. Uh, the Pharmacia Viva starts in 2006 and it starts to grow in, uh, in 2016. So it's burning. So uh, it's, today it's like a compounding pharmacy. It's very similar. The, the essential difference is that the Pharmacia Viva, the living pharmacy, is able to start by the plant. So they can plant in and then manufacture uh, the products. Uh, the problem in that is that plant is not a material without culture. So this plant uh, have a tradition 
And when it's in the laboratory, the transformations put the community outside uh, in different ways. So Nancy asked how we could decolonize medications. Uh, I guess uh, one way to do it uh, is consider the traditional uh, in the in the same equality of the scientific way, like put in the same in the same uh, platform. You know, uh, if you do that, questions arise about how, how the reaches of all or on scientific practice, it creates possibilities to reconstruct reconstruct practices and policies that preserve the community and the facing of overwhelming position of colonialism. So the first effort, I guess, is abandoning this term, medication, uh, pharmacy, and then, or revisiting the cosmopolitical commitments of and, and just to, to complement, Erica and Malika also asked if Han have a kind of tourism with ayahuasca that is if or not related to the living pharmacy. No, it's a kind of laboratory, it's an aromatic place we cannot visit. Um, and it's dedicated to manufacture the biodiversity of Brazil. Great. Thank you, Pedro. Um, uh, Julia, it looks like we have a question for you about using the analytical lens of the senses in the history of medicine and pharmacy. So if you would like to say a few things about that. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to find that question. Is that written down here? Uh, yeah, it's in the chat. Uh, so it's it's from Lucas. He says, if possible, can you speak a bit more generally about using the analytical analytical okay. lens of the senses? Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, I think yeah, I think it, uh, it it does go back to this uh, this idea of the uh, apothecary being very much aware of the physical uh, nature of, of the product that they're using, um, and this idea that you know they used their senses to smell. To touch, to to you know, um, identify the colour of, of the pigments used was was all part and parcel of, of you know understanding how and and what to use. So it was it was crucial really that uh, it you know it it was definitely um, something that they relied heavily on. Uh, it seems, and I think it is partly because the apothecary was such a, a general. Um, place to go for, for all sorts of different different types of, of ingredients. But uh, this, in order to, to know the ingredients that you were working with, uh, the products that you were working with, it was, it was crucial to have a sense of, of what they were about. So um, I think, I think uh, that, that is, is probably how that, how that uh, came to be. Great, great. Thank you. Um, let's see. Oh, we still have time. <laughs> Uh, so we have a question for Eduardo about um, asking, why did you choose to use the word, uh, the late 19th century word addiction in um, framing this talk about early modern sources? So um, Eduardo, if you'd like to comment on that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I use the word because it seems the most direct to me. And but also because I would say that even if in the 17th century uh, all the matter of drugs and stuff was not deemed, so it lacks for us of a specific vocabulary. Uh, the, um, the word addiction actually they used to use it uh, in the 17th century. Uh, there is some in some treatises there are some sentences like Turks uh, used to addict themselves with opium and other stuff. So it looks to me that that in the 17th century is the, um, is the start of this of this matter. So the word addiction looks, looked fine for me to, to describe all this uh, all this uh, evolution also in the vocabulary of um, addiction, which is, is very difficult sometimes when you where when you work with, with sources where there is the, all the vocabulary we know about addiction, drugs, 
there is not even to describe the uh, effect of the drugs. For example, John Jones uh, used to describe the effects of opium, used the expression swimming in the minds, uh, swimming in the head. So they use this strange expression. And uh, But I, the word addiction in the 17th century had a signification very close to, um, to the one of the 19th and 20th century. Great. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you to you. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Uh, <clears throat> there is a, a comment. <laughs> um, so it, maybe I'll, I'll sort of invoke chair's privilege and, and ask a question. Of course, I have questions for, for each of you, but I think given that we've got um, a little bit of time left, uh, maybe I'll just kind of ask a, a general question. And I was trying to think about how to bring these three papers together because we have two early modern ones and then we have um, Pedro's question about, uh, or paper about um, neo-traditional uh, medications and the living pharmacy in Brazil. And and I guess I, I, I'd be curious to get your, your you three's thoughts on the role that maybe historical thinking or historical scholarship can play in, um, helping us think about medicaments or drugs today, whatever terminology you want to use. And so I guess I'm kind of asking the early modernists to kind of think, you know, what is early, mo how, how can early modern history help us thinking today? And and maybe asking Pedro to kind of reflect on how history can inform or how history has informed uh, what he's been thinking about. So I, it's a very broad question, I know, but. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, silence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go first then. Uh, Thanks. Well, I think, you know, that we've, we've seen that this, this to traditional um, pharmaceutical knowledge is becoming, you know, extremely important um, in, a, in a world where um, big farmers are sort of becoming more and more, uh, you know, huge and, and perhaps uh, getting out of control. So I think it is really important to, to, to return to the original, you know, um, reasoning why, why, you know, certain plants were used. You can see that certainly in the early modern period. That's why it just kept, it keeps on being repeated. They keep on going back to the, to the ancient sources because they, it, they simply made sense in, in many ways. Um, although, you know, a lot of the time it was partly because, you know, it was a sort of, you know, using plants and, and the natural world was obviously all they had, and so they had to use it and had to get to know it. And I think that's what was so important, really. Um, they had no other uh, other chemical alternative at the time, but I think you, you know now we're we're returning to that, and actually the reasoning behind that is is fairly sensible. So I think it, it did come from it, it. Just made sense what the ancients were saying in in many ways, and that's why it just gets repeated over and over again. And you just see keep seeing these same sources and the same um ingredients uh, pop up again and again and again which is, is fascinating really yeah yeah great thanks um yeah i mean and i think it's it's an interesting uh I, I mean i think that's an important consideration and then but it gets complicated when you're sort of thinking about um medicaments from colonial contexts and stuff and accessing those uh, traditional knowledges and so forth and so um yeah, uh, Eduardo, Pedro, would you like to jump in here? Lucas has also posted a question about sort of directions to take early modern medicine or pharmacy, if you'd like to comment on that. Yeah, just, just want to say that I completely agree with Julia. And then something I can add, uh, working on opiates, uh, is that what's really struck me about the early modern approach um, uh, of physicians to this matter is that their approach was very um, natural. Uh, we, um, I remember that in the presentation of this conference, on the first um, presentation, I guess, maybe, uh, there was a debate about the um, negative connotation of the word drug now, for example. And what I can say about the early modern period, that this all this uh, sovereign structure of meaning and signification didn't exist. So drugs were the same thing like food, 
um, but also medicaments, they, there, was, there weren't any boundaries between them. And I guess this approach could be useful even now, because I, I find that um, and now there is some very um, hard approach uh, against the so-called drugs and uh, illegal drugs, and by contrast, there is not so much interest against, against uh, on the so-called uh, soft drugs, for example, sugar-based um, drinking and so on. So I guess maybe this approach um, could help the early model. And um, yeah, that's that's what uh, maybe I can, I don't know if Pedro maybe want to yeah. continue. Okay, that, just to, to conclude, uh, I guess when we are, we are talking about the early modern history, talking about Latin America, is it, is it interesting to think uh, which early modern history do we need to talk about? You know, like in Brazil especially, the traditional people is for the state, uh, like the Brazilian state uh, uh, is for the G8 countries. <laughs> uh, they do not have voice, you know, and when we have this kind of movement to bring back the modern, the traditional people to to reconstruct the, the, the biomedical practice here, uh, which kind of traditional people and which kind of voice we are uh, doing uh, when it's institutionalized, you know. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good uh, comment, Pedro. And it was something I was thinking about reading your paper. You know, essentially, who counts as traditional? Traditional, mm -hmm. right? There's there's a whole politics I can imagine around that, and depending on different uh, uh, locations, you know, different political contexts. Uh, and uh, yeah, great. Um, so we are at 1130 and I don't see any additional questions. Um, and uh, yeah, now we're getting an announcement about the next session. So um, I, I think if there aren't any additional questions, uh, I would just like to um, thank everyone for coming to this session. And of course, thank our three presenters, um, Eduardo, Pedro and Julia for these three excellent presentations and, and much uh, much interesting material to think about. So thank you very much.